Hello, and welcome to this episode of our Brexit video series, Brexit One Year On. My name is Mike Ross, and I'm a Senior Associate in the Commercial IP and Technology Department here at Travis Smith. In this episode, I'll be discussing the impact of Brexit on contracts. The first point to mention is that the United Kingdom is no longer part of the European Union or the European Economic Area. Now, that may sound like stating the obvious, and it is. But I mention it because there are clearly many contracts still in existence that include references to the EU and the EEA on the assumption that these terms include the UK. For example, distribution agreements with an EU distribution territory or data processing agreements with references to transfers of data of personal data outside of the EEA. While the court would probably construe pre-existing contracts as including the UK in the event of a dispute, given that that would have been the intention of the parties when they entered into the contract, it is important to revisit these references upon renewal of the contract or in any new contracts to ensure the position is clear now that the UK has left the EU and the EEA. Also worthy of note is that increased border friction with the EU means that the UK is now suboptimal as a goods distribution hub for the whole of the EU. So from a territory perspective, it may no longer make commercial sense for, say, a Japanese manufacturer to appoint a UK distributor to cover both the UK and the EU, unless that distributor already has a substantial logistics operation in the EU. Similarly, businesses involved in the supply of goods may want to think twice about whether they accept a territory which covers the whole of the UK. This is because different arrangements apply in Northern Ireland, which may impose an additional burden that may be worth avoiding. Some businesses are therefore opting for Great Britain as their chosen territory, effectively carving out Northern Ireland. Finally, on the topic of territory, another issue which is causing some businesses to rethink their distribution arrangements is the exhaustion of intellectual property rights, particularly trademark rights relating to goods. Now, this is potentially a topic for an entire webinar, but I will try to distill it as best as I can. Generally speaking, trademark goods can only be sold in a particular territory with the specific consent of the trademark owner for that territory. If you haven't got their consent, then the trademark owner would normally use their rights to prevent the sale. But within the EU single market, once the trademark goods are placed on the market in any one member state, the trademark holder's rights are said to be exhausted for the whole of the single market. That means the trademark holder cannot use his trademark rights to object to the goods being sold elsewhere in the single market on the basis of a lack of specific consent. So what is the position now that the UK has left the EU single market? The main change is that IP rights can now be used to protect EU distributors from competition from UK distributors in a way that was not possible before Brexit. This is because the UK is considered to be outside of the, of the EU for exhaustion purposes, so trademark rights relating to goods first sold in the UK will not be deemed to have been exhausted at that point before any onward sale into the EU. On the flip side, the UK has chosen to maintain the pre-Brexit position, which means trademark goods placed on the market in the EU can be brought into the UK without having to worry about the consent of the trademark owner. So for importers, there is essentially no change. The result of that of this imbalance is that UK businesses exporting goods for resale in the EU will need the consent of the EU rights holder before doing so. At the same time, IP rights holders in the EU will have significantly more scope to restrict the supply of their goods from the UK into the EU. The government is now consulting on whether the UK should move to a system of international exhaustion, which is not something it could have done inside the EU. There are fears that if these proposals go ahead, some brand holders may find themselves being undercut by cheap imports from less wealthy countries where the same products are available at a lower price. The main counter arguments are that consumers benefit from lower prices and a number of other major trading countries such as Japan and the US already operate international exhaustion regimes to varying extents. So let's watch this space. Moving on from territory, there are a number of other aspects of contracts on which Brexit has had an impact. Change control and variation procedures have often come under the spotlight many times over the past couple of years, in particular as to which party should bear the cost of a change necessitated by post-Brexit trading conditions. There is sometimes a debate about the nature of the change. For example, is it due to a change in law, or has it really been prompted by a change in behaviour of suppliers or other parties in response to Brexit? That can make quite a significant difference to the dynamics of the process because change control provisions often make a distinction between mandatory changes, such as those which need to be made in response to changes in law, 
and other changes where it's essentially in the customer's discretion as to whether to accept it or not. Inquiry-term-based contracts have also come under particular scrutiny on the basis that they draw clear lines of responsibility between buyers and sellers in cross-border contracts for the sale of goods for things like shipping costs, insurance and tariffs. We've come across multiple businesses finding that Inco terms they used while the UK was part of the EU are no longer appropriate now that the UK has left. In particular, we've seen a lot of suppliers switching to the X-Works Inco term, which is the most favourable for suppliers. Although a practical point worth remembering for UK suppliers is that if you're going to use the X-Works Inco term, you will need to obtain evidence that your goods have actually been exported outside of the UK. Otherwise, you risk having to account for UK VAT. The reason that this is an issue is because exporting on XWorks terms will require your customer to collect the goods from your premises, so the customer will normally be the one with the proof of export and not you. Over the past two years or so, we've also answered a number of queries about force majeure provisions being invoked in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic and other current supply chain issues, such as the global chip shortage. But the issue of force majeure has been less prominent in relation to Brexit, in very general terms, this is likely because force majeure clauses do not typically offer relief in respect to events which are foreseeable. And unlike COVID-19, Brexit was well trailed in advance and there were reasonable steps that businesses could have taken to prepare for it. This will of course depend on the precise wording of the clause in each case, although it's clear from the cases that have come before the courts that there is a general reluctance to grant relief on the basis of Brexit-related impacts. If you would like any more information on any of the points that I've discussed in this video, please visit our Beyond Brexit portal on our website, which includes a number of briefings on topics such as Inco terms, force majeure, and the impact of Brexit on contracts more generally. Or please feel free to get in touch. Thanks for listening.